Hello folks. The last lesson we talked about demand, we defined it, we graphed it, we looked at a demand curve, we looked at a demand schedule, and we talked a little bit about why the demand curve slopes down or to the right. Today we're going to revisit this curve but then take it another step. We're going to draw the distinction between this concept of quantity demanded, which is what we discussed yesterday, and this concept of a change in demand itself. So there's a difference between change in quantity demanded, moving up and down an existing demand curve, and a change in demand, which will actually produce a shift in the demand curve. That's where we're headed today. First, quick review. Yesterday we were analyzing the widget market and we noted that at a high prices, the quantity demanded of widgets tended to be low. But as the price changed, as the price decreased, the quantity of dem demanded of widgets increased. Example, at a price of five, the last lesson we noted that consumers only wanted 10 widgets and that produced a point A. But if we drop the price to $4 per widget, consumers now wanted 17, producing a point here at 417, which is B. So a change in price here produced a movement down the demand curve and increased the quantity demanded. Change in price, change in quantity demanded. So built into every demand curve are combinations of price and quantity. So if you have questions where price changes, don't shift the curves. Just move up and down the demand curve. Are there situations though that will produce a change in demand? The answer is absolutely. Uh, a set of assumptions that we have, one assumption that we make when we analyze markets is the Cateris Paribus assumption or uh, Ket Par assumption. And that's when we hold all the other types of behaviors and events that could affect the market constant. All we want to do is examine changes in price and the corresponding changes in quantity demanded. If we lift that assumption and change another variable that could impact the market here, then we might have a change in demand. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There are six of those types of events. Consumer expectations, consumer tastes and preferences, number of consumers in the market, changes in consumers' income, and changes in price with re uh, respect to substitute goods and complementary goods. Anytime we have any change in one of these types of variables, or things that we call non-price determinants, we will have a change in demand. Here's how it works. Let's say, for first, that I have a change in consumer expectations. Let's say that I've got whole bunch of consumers that expect the price of automobiles to change uh, in three months time. That might affect their purchase of automobiles right now. We expect a price increase in three months time. We're probably going to purchase them right now if we had planned on doing it. What does that look like? Well, that's not a change in price. That's a change in the expectations of price that is affecting our ability and willingness to purchase in the right now, in the here and now. That's an increase in demand. Expect the price of autos to go up sometime in the future. I'm going to demand more automobiles right now. The demand curve then shifts. We've got an increase in demand. So at every single price, we increase the number of, 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 of the amount of automobiles that we're, that we're wanting. And that looks like a right shift in the demand curve, which I've just done there. Constructed a completely new demand curve to show the increase in demand. And I've labeled it D1 to compare it and to contrast it against our original demand curve. So a right shift in demand represents an increase in demand. And in this case, I, I raised fears of automobile prices changing sometime in the future and it impacting people's demands right now. Second one, changes in consumers' tastes and preferences. It could very well be, sticking with my automobile industry, that um, engineers or a certain car company warn that uh, certain four-wheel drive 
automobiles sitting too high off the ground uh, flip very easily. And uh, if they warn against that, it probably means that we will be demanding less of those vehicles. So if it's these four by four automobiles that we've been warned uh, might flip over easily, we will consume less of them now. It doesn't have anything to do with price. It has to do with these warnings, and that's a shift in consumers' tastes and preferences away from these kinds of 4x4s. What does that look like? It looks like a left shift in the demand curve, denoted by D2. Again, to compare it and contrast it against our original demand curve. Left shift, decrease in demand. The third non-price determiner, the third event that can affect our, our our consumption or the number of consumers in the market. Uh, again, sticking with the automobile industry, uh, there have been a reduction in the number of consumers in the automotive market in the last couple of years. Uh, people just simply cannot afford uh, or think they cannot afford automobiles and they're not willing anymore to purchase new vehicles, particularly new 4x4s. So if we shrink the number of demanders in the market, uh, as we have had happen in the United States in the last couple of years, we have a left shift in demand. So our initial demand curve will shrink to D2. Left shift, decrease in demand. Consumer's income. Uh, interesting thing about income. There are certain goods called normal goods that we demand more of when our incomes increase. If our incomes increase, we demand more of new cars, new laptops, uh, nice tuition to private schools. These are all normal goods. In other words, the demand for them goes up as our incomes increase. Inferior goods are exactly the opposite. As our incomes increase, we demand less of them. So for example, an inferior good when incomes are rising would be uh, used clothing or used cars. And again, uh, Based on how I'm shifting my income, uh, if it's uh, for four by fours, new four by fours, if I increase in income, my income, I'll increase the demand for these vehicles. If I decrease the income for, uh, for consumers, then I decrease the demand for these new four by fours and, and demand would shift from D to D2. Last of all, uh, the price of substitutes and complements. Uh, I guess if we wanted to consider uh, four by fours and maybe four door sedan vehicles as a substitute, uh, if I if I increase the price of sedan vehicles, if I increase the price of sedan vehicles, then the demand for four by fours as a near substitute was probably going to increase. I've got the choice of sedan, I've got the choice of a 4x4, sedans increase in their price, I'm going to demand more 4x4s. And so demand in this case would shift from D to D1. Uh, complementary goods are used in conjunction with one another, gas and automobiles. So if I increase the price of gas and that price increase of gasoline sustains for a while, Sooner or later, I will probably demand fewer and fewer automobiles because they're used in conjunction with one another. It's one of the things that is actually happening here in the U.S. So uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, decrease the price of gasoline. I know that's probably laughable, but if I decrease the price of gasoline and that price decrease stays sustained, then sooner or later, I will probably demand more new 4x4s. Um, and, and so that would produce a shift from D to D1. So we've talked about here the six non-price determinants or the six variables that will cause a change in demand or a shift in demand. And we've contrasted that earlier on in the video to uh, changes in price which produce a change in the quantity demanded. Hope that makes sense. I'll see you soon. Thanks.